What's up? My name is Matthew, and in this video we're going to talk about integer exponents and scientific notation. Let's start with the basics. This first example problem has <clears throat> us taking negative 3 and raising it to the second power. And as you know, raising something to the second power means taking that thing and multiplying it by itself. So this equates to negative 3 times negative 3. A negative times a negative is a positive, and the 3 times 3 makes 9. In the next problem, we're taking negative 2 and raising it to the second power. And I think what I'll do is actually modify that and let's see if we can be clever about this. Can we take this? That needs to be bigger. Can we get rid of the... Maybe I can just redo this. Just writing over this with a white pen. And let's then take a black pen and change it to negative 3 to the second power. So now we can really compare this to the first one that we looked at. Obviously, visually, there's a little difference with the absence of the parentheses here. And the impact that this has is substantial. What you need to realize here is that this is the same thing as writing negative 1 times 3 squared. I would say pretty much any time you see a negative number, you can think of it as negative 1 times that number. So in this case, we've got negative 1 times 3 squared. In the order of operations, PEMDAS tells us that we need to apply the exponent first. So we're going to take the 3 and square it and get 9. And then we do the multiplication, parentheses, exponents, exponents we just did, then M, P-E-M, M stands for multiplication. We do this multiplication, we get negative 9. So it really drives home the importance of being aware of order of operations and making sure that you're especially cognizant of the parentheses. In number seven, <clears throat> which does not come after number two, except for here, but that's okay. In number seven, we're taking this quantity of 5xy and raising it to the third power. And remember what it means to raise something to the third power. It means multiply it by itself three times. So... I've got some space over here. I'm going to write this as 5xy times 5xy times 5xy. <clears throat> Ultimately, you're not going to do it like this, but just to really kind of drive home the concept, I want you to also realize that the 5 and the x and the y, each of those are individually separated by multiplication. So there's a lot of multiplication going on in this problem. And you might also remember the commutative property of multiplication, which says, for example, 2 times 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2. So if it's all multiplication, we can kind of swap things around. And we could write this as 5 times 5 times 5 times x times x times x times y times y times y. Even though that first y doesn't look very good, it's still a y. And then if we consolidate this a little bit, we could write it as 5 to the third times x to the third times y to the third. And to fully simplify this expression, we will take the 5 and actually cube it. So we'll multiply it by itself three times, which is 125. And then we won't write those little multiplication dots anymore. We'll just mash these things right next to each other. And we get a final answer of 125 x to the third, y to the third. Couldn't we have just taken this exponent and, and sort of distributed it to these factors that are inside of here? <clears throat> Visually, it looks like that's what we're doing, which is fine. But it's important that you actually realize what's happening behind the scenes. And it's going to be especially important when we get to a problem like, well, I don't, I don't see it written out there exactly what it is that I'd like to see, so let me just create it real quick. What if we had x plus 5 to the second power? Is this equal to x to the second plus 5 to the second? It's not. So 
while you can do this thing that looks like a distributive property up here, you cannot do that down here. So instead of sort of training your mind to think that there's such a thing as the distributive property of exponents, maybe it's not such a good idea. It might be a little dangerous to think of it in, in those terms. Better is to remember very basic stuff. Remember what it means to square something. Here you have to take, so these are not equal to each other, but what it is equal to is x plus 5 times x plus 5. I'm taking the x plus 5 and multiplying it by itself. From here, you would FOIL and combine like terms. So I'm not going to do that. That's not part of this lesson. Just really trying to impress upon you the possible danger of thinking that there is a distributive property for exponents. Better to just remember what's really going on behind the scenes. All right, so let's change gears a little bit here. <clears throat> Number eight turns this into a division problem. And instead of exponents causing multiplication here, it's kind of causing division. And what you need to be aware of when you have two factors like x and x. So in the numerator and denominator, we have kind of a common base. They both say x to a power. And when that's the case, you can subtract the exponents, but you have to do them in the right order. You must do the upper exponent minus the lower exponent. So in this case, it equals x to the negative 4 minus 6. And maybe even put both of those exponents in parentheses to really highlight that the negative 4 is its own thing, the 6 is its own thing, we're subtracting them, and the result is x to the negative tenth power. Now we're going to talk about this more during this lesson. I wish I could teach you about five things simultaneously, but it wouldn't sound very good. So what I'm going to sort of tack on to the end of this problem is that sometimes you're going to be requested to write your final answer using a positive exponent. So you need to know right now that a negative exponent tells us to take the reciprocal. And the result of that is being able to write this as 1 over x to the positive 10th power. There are a bunch of different ways that I can describe how it is that I got to that. But I have not talked to you about all of the tools necessary to give you the descriptions that I'd like to. So for the moment, we're going to keep going. But realize that um, either this or this could be listed as a final answer. And sometimes it'll be helpful to leave that negative exponent there during a solution process. All right, so a negative exponent tells us to take the reciprocal. I bet you've written that into your notes, which is gonna be handy because in this next problem, we have another fraction involving some negative exponent. And if we apply very purely that idea that if I see a negative in the exponent position, that means I can take the reciprocal. Let's see what happens. The negative says take the reciprocal, so we will. The y appears on top. The x goes into the denominator. Keep that packaged up in between those parentheses. And the exponent becomes a positive 7. It's almost like the uh, negative sign in the exponent is kind of a single-use item. We used it uh, like casting a spell in order to take the reciprocal, and now we don't have access to that spell anymore. Or you could think of it as a bus ticket or whatever you like, whatever creative analogy you have. But it's a single-use thing, and then it disappears. Okay, now can I apply that distributive property of exponents that I'm not supposed to be implementing? You can. And you do get y to the 7th over x to the 7th, but I want you to know why that's happening. It's happening because y to the 7th power is really telling us to take, uh, sorry, y over x to the 7th power is really telling us to take y over x and multiply it by itself seven times. Let's see if I can do that quickly. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All 
All right, that's about as good as my handwriting gets at that rate of speed with the digital pen on the iPad, for which I still have not gotten a screen protector, which will probably eventually help my handwriting, but for the moment we're stuck with this. Now, how do you multiply fractions? The answer is you multiply the numerators times each other, which is y times y times y times y times seven times, <clears throat> which can be consolidated into y to the seventh. Apply the same property to the denominator, multiplying all those denominators together, so a little reminder for you on how to multiply fractions. y to the 7 over x to the 7. In the future, you'll skip this part, but it's important that you see it so that you know what's really going on. Uh, nothing else to see over there. So in the previous problem, number 8 even, just uh, right above us here, we saw that when you have a quotient where you have the same base in the numerator and denominator, you get to subtract the exponents. Guess what you do when you're multiplying those like bases? You will add the exponents. So here we have x to the power of 3 plus negative 7 plus the 4 which equals, now this is a little unusual. Uh, do I even like this? Well, we'll run with it. So it equals x to the zero. This is not your final answer, however. You need to be aware, and I think we run into this again one more time in these notes, you need to be aware that when you take anything and raise it to the power of zero, the result is one. It's a little unusual, and I could show you a pattern that would help you get to uh, a deeper understanding of why something to the power of zero is equal to one. But for the moment, that's something that you should highlight or put a star next to in your notes. Anything to the power of zero equals one, except for zero. Zero to the zero is a different story. You should know what the answer to number 11 is now. I have a thing, even though it's a very unusual looking, kind of scary large number with a weird big exponent, I'm still taking all of that stuff wrapped up in parentheses and raising it to the power of zero. And we just finished saying anything other than zero raised to the power of zero is equal to one. I like those, those are easy. So we've seen fractions where you do the upper exponent minus the lower exponent. That's division. We've seen multiplication where you add the exponents. And I like that association really. If division, which I think is pretty easy to remember that you do the upper minus the lower, and multiplication is the opposite of that. So instead of doing subtraction, you do addition. When it comes to taking a thing to a power to another power, here is when we're allowed to multiply the exponents. y to the power of negative 6 times negative 2, and that is equal to y to the 12. It is indeed as simple as that. There will be times <clears throat> when you'll take something that looks sort of like this, and instead of having the exponents next to each other like multiplication like this, you'll actually go backwards and split them up and rewrite it as the base to a power to another power. We're a little ways away from that, but just realize that at the, in the, at the moment, we're sort of working from left to right. Sometimes you'll work this thing from right to left. All right, so we're making things look a little bit more complicated now. So I've got some numbers to some powers, some variables to some powers, and it's all as a big fraction. Can I really apply those usual practices of doing the upper exponent minus the lower exponent? And the answer is you can. Remember that uh, 
A over B times C over D is equal to A times C over B times D. So you can take the product of two fractions and you multiply the numerators together and you multiply the denominators together and it ends up being written as one larger fraction. Can you work this process from right to left? Could you take one big fraction and split it up and write it as the product of different fractions? Absolutely. So I could write this as 2 to the negative 8 over 2 to the negative 4 as its own fraction times x to the negative 2 over x to the negative 5 as its own fraction times as its own fraction y to the third over y to the six. And then maybe it would be more clear that you can um, sort of temporarily disregard those and just think of this as that more simplified problem where top and bottom, they each have the same base so we can do the subtraction of the exponents. But here it's being written all as one big blob for us. So let's try to work it just like this. Upper exponent minus the lower exponent, that's negative eight minus negative four. Be careful, double negative. Negative eight minus negative four. That's the same thing as negative eight plus four. Now if you need to write out all of those steps, I don't blame you, you should definitely do that. Right here it should say negative 8 minus negative 4. I'm doing the arithmetic in my head and going straight to 2 to the negative 4th power. Next we've got x to the negative 2 over x to the negative 5. So we do upper exponent minus lower exponent. That's negative 2 minus negative. Be wary of the double negative again. So we can read it like it's negative 2 plus 5, which would be x to the positive 3. And lastly, upper exponent minus the lower exponent, we've got y to the negative three. You might be able to write your final answer like this, but if we have to write it using positive exponents, I'm going to set myself up with a fraction. I've got x to the positive third in the numerator. That one does not have the bus ticket to get down to the denominator, that single use negative in the exponent position. The two does, however, We've got 2 to the negative 4, so I can write that in the denominator as 2 to the positive 4. The y has that negative bus ticket in the exponent position, so she can make her way down to the denominator. And we'll write that as y to the positive third, having used the ticket. And then in the denominator, in order to fully simplify, we will take 2 and raise it to the fourth power, which equals 16 and we'll get a final answer of x to the third over 16 times y to the third. And I do like to put my final answers in a box. And then in number 14, I think we're combining all of those ideas. We want to simplify vertically inside the parentheses, and we are following PEMDAS here, P-E-M-D-A-S, parentheses is the P, that comes first, so we should do everything that we can do inside the parentheses. So let's do that. 12 divided by 3 is 4. x to the 3 over x to the 1, sorry, x to the negative 3 over x to the 1 makes x to the negative 4, up, upper exponent minus lower exponent, We've got y to the negative 2 over y to the negative 2. That makes y to the 0. Wait a second. These two things are exactly the same. Shouldn't those just cancel out? Absolutely. And when they do cancel out, what are you going to get? Well, what's anything divided by itself? Just like 5 over 5 or negative 6 over negative 6, anything divided by itself is equal to 1. Guess what y to the 0 equals? We'll write it as a one in the next step. And lastly, we've got z to the four minus negative four, which makes z to the eight. Be careful with the double negative there. Close and to the negative third power. Now, before taking things, factors, and using those negative exponents and putting things in the denominator and whatnot, 
I'm going to apply my exponent of negative 3. And I'm going to use that uh, sort of distributive idea, even though that's not what's really happening. I'm really taking all this stuff and multiplying it by itself three times. And then the negative will uh, persist and cause us to take the reciprocal. But we're going to do that one at a time. <clears throat> We've got 4 to the negative 3. So I will end up multiplying the 4 by itself three times, and I will end up taking the reciprocal because of that negative exponent. I've got x to the negative 4 to the negative 3, which, which makes x to the positive 12. I'm multiplying those exponents. Anything to a power to another power. Multiply the powers. Negative 4 times negative 3 gave us the 12. y to the 0 to the negative 3. I'm going to let that go y to the 0 is equal to 1. If you want to come in here with another colored pencil or something, or a pen, or a highlighter, and put a little note, maybe y to the 0 equals 1, that's not a bad idea. And then lastly, you've got z to the 8 to the negative 3, which makes z to the negative 24. Now we're ready to start using those uh, those tickets, those bus tickets, and moving things down to the denominator. I think I will move over here a little bit. I'm going to set up a fraction. I've got x to the positive 12, so she's staying right where she is. The 4 to the negative 3, he's going to spend that ticket and go down to the denominator, so we'll have 4 to the positive 3. And z to the negative 24, <clears throat> they are going to use their ticket, move to the denominator, and have their new positive exponent of 24. And the last step in cleaning this up will be to simplify by taking 4 and actually raising it to the third power, which gives us x to the 12 over 64 times z to the 24. And that is your final answer. I think that's all of the things. We did multiplication, we raised powers to powers. We did division, so we subtracted exponents. We had negative exponents, so we moved things into the denominator. Uh, this is just kind of another one of those combination problems where we can use um, sort of multiple processes. This is all multiplication. Between the three, negative 3 and the x to the 5, there's multiplication. Between the x to the 5 and the y to the negative 6, multiplication. Between these parentheses, which aren't really doing anything, there's multiplication. And multiplication and multiplication. It's all multiplication. So we can shuffle these things around. You could actually shuffle them around and write them out, or you can just shuffle them around in your mind. I'm going to take the negative 3 and put it next to the positive 5, do that multiplication, and get negative 15. Then I'm going to take the x to the 5 and the x to the negative 1, put them next to each other, still separated by multiplication. x to the 5 times x to the negative 1. Add the exponents when it's multiplication and get x to the 4. Then look at the y factors, negative 6, and then invisible y to the positive 1. The, well, the y is not invisible, but the 1 was invisible. So we've got... Uh, we add the exponents again. Negative 6 plus 1 makes negative 5, so we have y to the negative 5. If we need to write our answer with positive exponents, you might see the negative from the 15 written next to the division symbol, or the fraction bar. x to the 4, that was a positive exponent, so it's staying up on top. y to the negative 5, next negative exponent. Push it down to the denominator y to the positive 5. Spend that ticket, get rid of that exponent, or that negative in the exponent. It's now y to the positive 5 in the denominator. And that's as simplified as that one gets. So that is a look at the sort of properties of exponents. What I'd like to do now is to go back through those and just write out a couple of general rules. The first one that I'll point out sort of relates to number 7. <clears throat> and the way that I'm going to write this out for you is a times b in parentheses to the m is equal to a to the m times b to the m. 
So this is the kind of general property that goes along with number seven. Uh, let's see. Do I want to write that on number 12? No, well, let's go to number eight, sorry. Uh, the general property that's happening here is it's kind of like a quotient rule for exponents. If you have a to the m over a to the n, that's equal to a to the m minus n. And notice that I'm still using that idea of upper exponent minus lower exponent. So this is the pattern that goes along with problem number eight. In number nine, it's similar to number seven in that, let me switch colors here, I think. If you have a over b to the m, that's equivalent to a to the m over b to the m. So this goes along with number nine. Now the other thing that happened in number nine was that negative exponent. So I'm also going to associate this idea that um, a over b to the negative one is equal to b over a. It's difficult to describe these different um, properties or processes or rules maybe uh, when they're all kind of uh, stirred together. So I'm just writing them out um, sort of individually and then realize that sometimes they need to be combined like in problem number nine where you have a fraction to a power but that power also happens to be negative. So it told us to take the reciprocal. So that is power rule. We're sort of distributing. We've got a quotient rule. Uh, what's happening in number 10 we have a base of b to the m, and we're multiplying it by the same base raised to another power. Doesn't have to be a different power, could be though. And that's equal to the b, that's equal to b to the m plus n. So there's your generality for number 10. Number 11 says that a to the power of zero is equal to one. And then you might put a little note in here where a does not equal zero. That's a conversation for another day. And number 12 is the power rule. Here we see that if you have a to the power of m and you're raising that all to the power of n, then you can take your exponents or your powers and multiply them together, you get a to the mn, mn. There we go, that's number 12. And then everything I think that we saw after that, yep, was just combinations of those properties. I really, really like this idea. I'm talking to more and more of my students about doing things like this with fewer bubbles and maybe fewer colors and better organized and maybe even on flashcards or index cards or if there's a, an online utility that you like that allows you to create flashcards like Quizlet or something and you can actually type this kind of stuff in, great, go for it. But naming things like, <clears throat> well, what we did in number nine is still kind of a power rule. Uh, number seven, I don't even know what the name of that is. It's almost like a distributive property, but we said don't think of it that way. Number 10, I would, I think we can safely call this the product rule for exponents. Number 11 is just kind of a definition. Uh, number 12 is called the power rule for exponents, R-U-L-E, rule, there we go. So we've got quotient or power rule, product rule. Where did I write out? Why don't I just zoom out so I can see everything? Oh, I wrote it in red right here next to number eight. This is the 
quotient rule. Q U O T I E N T rule. There you go. So the quotient rule allowed us to do upper minus lower as far as exponents were concerned. So writing down a name like quotient rule for exponents and putting that on one side of an index card and on the other side of the index card you should put two things. One of those things that I recommend that you put is <laughs> that's clearly not what I meant to do. One th the thing that I put on the other side of the index card is this kind of general version of the rule, the quotient rule in this case, and then I would also put some kind of a short, relatively basic, written out version or example of the use of that rule. So that you can flip this card over and reference those kinds of things would be great. And it's gonna kind of paint a picture, give you a pattern, not just generally with A's and M's and N's, but it's also going to give you an example that has some hard numbers in it. And then in your mind, when you run into problems like that on a quiz or on a test or on a homework assignment, something like that, I would bet that it's more likely to come back to you because you'll be able to envision not just that generalized rule with the A and the M and the N, but the example of the rule. That's the one with the actual numbers in it that I think is more likely to come back to you. So just a suggestion for you for a study tip. And then the other little subtopic I want to talk about in this section is scientific notation. Scientific notation is almost exclusively used when you're working with really large numbers or really small numbers. So here I would say that 120 million is a relatively large number. And in order to write that standard notation number in scientific notation, you're going to have two components. The first component is this number. In this case, it's 1.2. This number needs to be, let's call it lowercase a. This number a needs to be between 0 and 10. Strictly between 0 and 10. It can't actually be 10. It has to be sort of a single digit number, but it can have decimals after it. 1 1.2, 2.2, 3.2, 5.7, 9.999, totally fine. 10.7? Absolutely not. Okay, it's got to be between 0 and 10. Uh, and actually, that's a lie. It can't be 0.7. It actually has to be between 1 and 10. I knew that there was an or equal to symbol in there. It could be 1. So it has to be between 1 and 10. Could be 1, can't be 10. So like I said, think of it as it needs to be a single digit number. I don't think of 0.75 as a single digit number. I don't know why. That's not technically true, but anyway, these are the restrictions on A. It's got to be between 1 and 10. And then you're going to take that A value and you're going to multiply it by 10 to some power. The exponent on 10 will be an integer. Probably not going to be 0. That would be weird. Uh, but positive integer, negative integer, that's like negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, probably isn't going to be 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Sometimes, uh, at least when I was growing up, I called those whole numbers. But whole numbers technically only include the positive numbers. Integers also include the negative non-decimal numbers, okay? Negative whole numbers. So that's the format for scientific notation. Remember that when you, and maybe you don't remember this, but you need to know this. When you take a number like 1.2 and you multiply it by 10 to the eighth power, the way that I envision what's happening, like what's happening with the eight that I'm trying to draw down there, there we go. The way that I envision what happens when you do this kind of multiplication is 
I think of it as 1.20000. You put as many zeros at the end of this thing as you want to. We're not going to need that many. But when you multiply by 10 to the positive 8, we know that we're, our number is going to be getting bigger. And you can make it larger by moving this decimal to the right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 places. There you go. So this is now 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. All right, I just very carefully kept these lined up and brought all these down here. Let's get them all there. Bring this decimal point down with you or don't. We don't really need it. And then you could go back into it and put commas from right to left every three. And sure enough, we get that 120 million number. So 10 to a positive exponent, take the decimal place, move it to the right that many places. If it were a negative exponent, we would still write 1.2. Let's just do it. <clears throat> if you had, uh, is this a good place to write? Oh, we'll put it over here. If we had 1.2 times 10 to the negative eighth place, this means I'm gonna be moving my decimal eight places to the left so I'm going to write 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, almost as many zeros as you want, 1.2. And then I'm going to take that decimal place and I'm going to move it three places to the left. So three places, eight places to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So our decimal point is going to appear there. Now I'll copy everything straight down. Let's bring maybe the first zero and the decimal point, and then how many zeros do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros, and then the one and the two, and a one and two, and that's it. So translating back and forth between scientific notation and standard notation really involves moving decimal places. Now, a little bit trickier is to take a number that's written um, sort of long format in its standard notation and converting it into or back into scientific notation. Up here, we were taking scientific notation and turning it into standard notation. But now when we do that in reverse, it's a little bit tricky. So let's look at number 16 here. I know the format of scientific notation now. It's a number between 1 and 10 times 10 to a power. In number 16, I want the decimal to end up between the 6 and the 1, so that this says 6.12. That number is between 1 and 10, so I like that. But then the original number in standard notation, that's not where the decimal point was. The decimal point was to the left of there. How many places to the left of there? Well, come back, come back, come back. The decimal point, I'm writing it here, but to get it back to its original position, I have to move it to the left. One, two, three, four places to the left. So I'm going to take my 6.12 and multiply it by 10 to the negative 4 in order to slide that decimal point back where it came from. If you can sneak an equal sign in there, great. I'm gonna put a box around that because I'm happy that I got a final answer. And let's try number 17. Why don't you pause right now and try to write this number in scientific notation on your own and then push play again and we'll see what I get. Ready, pause. Oh, I don't have to pause, I'm gonna keep going. Let's see, I've got the five, six, seven, eight. I want the decimal point to end up here uh, or here. Where did it come from? It's to the left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven places. So I'm going to multiply by 10 to the negative seven places. There you go. We took our standard notation number and wrote it back into scientific notation. The difference between those and this one is those numbers were small and this number is really big. Let's make sure we're good on this one. 
I will take the, well, where do we want the decimal to be? I want it to be between the three and the five so that this says three point something. That way I'm working with a number that's between one and 10. So there's three point, and we are going to bring all these other numbers with us. So now I've got the decimal between the three and the five, but where, do I, where, where was it? It was at the end of this number, at the 7.0 if you want. So I need the decimal to move to the right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven places. So I'm going to take my 3.5 number and multiply it by 10, this time to the positive 7, so that it moves my decimal point seven places to the right and back where it used to be. So that's the conversion process back and forth. And the next thing we're going to do is divide numbers that are written in scientific notation. <clears throat> is this going to be easy? I think it will be. Sometimes there's one little hiccup that you have to watch out for. This first one looks pretty safe though. I'm going to, how do I have this set up? Don't even think about this. What's 6.6 .6 divided by 2? Hopefully you got 3.3. .3. That's correct. And then think about just this part. Base to an exponent over same base to an exponent. Upper minus lower, right? Negative 9 minus 3 is going to make negative 12. So it's going to be 10 to the negative 12. All right, let's write it up. We said equals 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative 12. Is that our final answer? In scientific notation it is. What if I wanted to write this number using standard notation? I'd have to move my decimal point 12 places to the left. So I would need 11 zeros to the left of this thing to accommodate movement of my decimal 12 places to the left. But let's leave it in scientific notation and check out number 18. Uh, well, number 18 is kind of boring. Since it's all multiplication, I'm going to multiply these two things together, and then I'm going to multiply these two things together. 1.8 times 2 makes 3.6 times, and then I've got a base of 10 and a base of 10. They're being multiplied together, so I can add the exponents. They're being multiplied together, so I can add the exponents. That's 3 plus negative 7 makes negative 4, so we've got 10 to the negative 4 final answer. So I need to make up one more problem for you. What about, um, let's call it number, let's call it number 19. And I'd like to do one more division problem. This time let's do two, two, now well, let's do three. Let's do three times 10 to the 7 over eight? Sure, let's do eight times 10 to the negative second power. All right, how am I supposed to deal with this? Well, Similar to the scribbling that I did before where I said, all right, don't think about this, just do three divided by eight. What is three divided by eight? And then don't think about those, just do 10 to the seven over 10 to the negative two. What's the new exponent there? The answer to those questions is three divided by eight is 0 0.375 times upper exponent minus lower exponent, that's seven minus negative I just subtracted a negative. 7 minus negative 2 is the same thing as 7 plus 2, so we get 10 to the power of 9. Did I do that just like I did problem number 17? Absolutely. Is this my final answer? Absolutely not. Why not? Because this number is not between 1 and 10. I told you one of these problems had a hiccup. That's the hiccup. That was really cheesy. So how am I supposed to take the 3.75 and turn it into 
a number that's between 1 and 10? The answer is I'm going to multiply it by 10 in order to slide the decimal one place to the right. Can I just interject multiplication by 10 into scientific notation just to slide things around? No, I cannot. The same rule applies here when you're working with any expression. The only thing that you're allowed to do is either multiply by 1 or add 0. So what we really need to be doing is multiplying by 1. Why? Because when you multiply by 1, you don't actually change the value of anything. But when you multiply by 10, clearly you change the value of the thing. So in order to balance out the fact that I'm introducing multiplication by 10, I'm also going to divide by 10. So I have a 10 over 10 right here. Could I cancel those out? Yes. I'm not going to though because then I'd be right back where I was in the previous step. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do this multiplication and I'm going to do this division so that I get a final answer of 3.75 times 10 to the 8. Upper exponent minus lower exponent, 9 minus 1, that makes 8. 10 to the 8. All right, my friends, I hope that that was a helpful, possibly review, possibly new education on various things that you can do with exponents, including an application of them to scientific notation. I don't know what we're doing in the next section, but I'm going over there. If you'd like to join me, I'll see you there. Thanks so much.